Hello, everybody. Today is part two with Terry Baranski talking about internal family systems. And what is the self? Like, when I say myself, what does that even mean? Are there parts to the self? Is it one big unanimous out of body entity? There are a lot of different ways to think about that. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. We're also going to unpack why IFS is such a great therapy for complex trauma, as well as what is trauma? How do we get it? And how does it work with our parts? So I hope you'll join us. We'll see you inside. Welcome everybody to the CPTSD podcast. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, your host and a licensed clinician. This is part two of a really interesting segment we're doing on internal family systems. We are here with uh, internal family systems therapist and expert Terry Baranski, and he has been talking with us in the last segment about how the self is comprised and specifically different parts of self and why that leads to a more compassionate approach to self. And so um, if you wanna learn more about uh, the protectors and the exiles, firefighters and the managers, go back and listen to that podcast or look up Terry um, on his website. Terry, just in case people missed the previous episode, would you please introduce yourself again, including contact information? Sure. Yeah, I'm Terry Baranski. Uh, the website is healingtheself.net, one word. And I'm an IFS practitioner. I started uh, three years ago after a career change from IT. And I'm super excited to be here for part two. <laughs> Me too. So uh, let's dive in. We have talked about different parts of self already. Is there a difference between all of our parts and what would be considered the big S self, you know, or other traditions or therapies called it, call it the center or the higher self? Talk about how these different parts integrate or don't integrate to form the self. Yeah, that's so important. Uh, so in IFS, the, the notion of self with a capital S is our essence, like the real us so to speak. And every spiritual and religious tradition has a name for this. You know, Buddhism calls it Buddha nature. In Hinduism, it's Atman. Every one of them has it. Uh, there's a book out there about this where they looked into this. And it's so it's been a recurring theme uh, over over the centuries. And, and so in IFS, we so much of the work with parts is forming relationships between them and self uh, for some of that reparenting that you mentioned in part one and some of that at some of that attachment work that uh, the parts did not get uh, when we were young. So when we're interacting with a part, the uh, the idea is to unblend from all the, you know, to a degree, because it's a spectrum, from all the parts that are present at, at that time, and then self just emerges. So that's the beautiful thing about it. We don't have to find self. We don't have to go looking for it. It's not a treasure hunt, right? It's It's more of uh, the analogy that's often used is on a cloudy day, you can't see the sun, but it's still there. Uh, and so when the clouds part, uh, or when the parts unblend, in, in our case, self just emerges. And there's there's a lot of qualities that, that uh, Richard Schwartz talks about with self that begin with C, uh, courage, compassion, curiosity, calm. I won't try to remember all of them, but you get the, get the idea. Uh, and that just emerges. And when he started finding that in everybody, even his most traumatized you know, DID level patients, uh, clients, he, he, he just noticed while wow, they all, once the parts unblend, this just appears in everybody. And so he concluded that, yeah, this is something we all have and it, it cannot be destroyed uh, by trauma. And part of the work is accessing that so that we can do the work with the, the parts internally that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think the concept of all parts being valid, which we talked about in the last episode, as well as this emergence of self, how do you think that differs than if we were going to go seeking self? What do you think? What do you think the benefit is to this approach? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think so much of IFS is even when we're talking to parts, we don't go looking for answers. And, and, and what I mean by that is we, we're not trying to figure anything out because if, if that's a thinking part mm -hmm. who's, who's trying to figure out, and this is what we do, you know, rationally, right? We try to figure things out. Uh, but in IFS, we don't communicate 
with parts that way because then we're not hearing from the part. We're, we're hearing from another one who's trying to figure things out. So we're asking questions and then we're just waiting for an answer to come. And if it sounds magical, it is. But if you haven't experienced it, like the answers will come and people are always amazed the first time. And then it just becomes normal. Like the answers will come. So it's waiting. It's being open to what comes. And, and self is the, the same way in a lot of cases where we're going to invite parts to unblend. So if I have a client and they're, let's say they're angry coming into a session and not that this is necessarily always the goal, but let's say hypothetically we have a goal to, to get to bring self energy right away into the picture i'll invite that angry part to pull some of its energy back mm -hmm. not all of it and i'm not asking it to go away i'm just saying can you dial it down a bit so that the person's self can emerge and be here with us so then it's the three of us because we can't help you unless the person's self is here because that's the attachment relationship i'm looking for it's not so much me to the part although it can be that initially it's the person's self to the person's part Mm -hmm. So when we do that, people will feel this. It's it's amazing. The part will unblend and then they'll say, oh, interesting. Now I'm curious about that one. And that's one of those C words. So, yeah. that, so that's the approach. If we go looking for it actively, it, it's probably another part that we're going to find that's either masquerading itself or maybe even thinks that it's self uh, and that that's not what we're looking for. Yeah, and I really like the way you're describing that process. And what I hear in that is that just the process of waiting for self or allowing self to come out increases trust of self, right? And also, I mean, the whole self, all the parts like, okay, we can do this together. So there is hope here. I just wanted to comment real quick. Uh, you said DID earlier, and I think maybe some people don't know what that is. And I have a comment about it. So here we go. Um, so DID is dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. I've worked with people who experience this way of being um, remarkably segmented. Parts don't even know about each other. Um, and IFS has been a real support in work with that type of individual um, because it's gentle and because it's not demanding and because there is not an overt goal of integration because parts don't want that. I mean, I've had a lot of overt resistance to integration. Have you experienced anything similar to that? Yeah, I, I it, it well, as soon as we say, or as soon as we say, as soon as we realize that we're born with parts and that that's a natural state of the mind, immediately, any approach to try and get rid of them just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and, anymore. And and while it, it's fully understandable that someone with the ID or somewhere on, you know, it's a spectrum, the ID is at one end of it, uh, someone who has no trauma is at the other end. Uh, and it, you, we can totally get why someone with the ID would, would possibly say, I hate my parts. I want them gone because the, it really makes life problematic when we have uh, individual personalities that don't know each other. And there's a lot of amnesia between them. Yes. And you can imagine, I mean, I, you know, we can only imagine trying to live that way and function. So it makes sense, but it, it's not, as you said, it, it's not something, it's not going to work, number one. So it's something that where some psychoeducation is necessary up front in some cases to say, hey, these, it's not the existence of the parts that is the problem. It's the roles that they're in, in the extreme fragmentation in a DID caliber system. That's the issue. And so that's where we would, that's what we're going to work on is, is not integration per se, but as soon as, again, the trauma is unloaded, there's going to be some more integration-like results, even though that's not specifically what we're after. Right. But it may look like that on the right. outside and through the lens of another practice or type of therapy. So thank you for saying that. That was really helpful. DID brings us to an issue that is near and dear to my heart. And I really appreciate the way you were talking about big T trauma, little T trauma, and developmental trauma. And these are buzzwords, especially big T and little T trauma, um, that aren't perfect. And I've always felt a little uh, dicey trying to describe what this is. And so would you please tell us from your perspective, what is big T trauma? little t trauma and developmental trauma sure yeah i like to separate between traumatic event and trauma mm -hmm. and i think that's something where the words get mixed up a little bit typically so traumatic event is what happened 
And trauma is the result inside of us of what happened. Because the same thing, the same traumatic event could happen to two people, and there's very different results internally, depending on what support they have, what the attachment relationships are like, all sorts of factors. Uh, so in terms of traumatic events, we hear a lot, big T and little t, big T being the overt, you know, whether it's a, a sexual assault or a car accident, specific events that happen. And then we hear little t, which is normally the more chronic parental attunement issues, attachment uh, issues. Uh, I, I'm not thrilled with those terms because there's nothing little about little t trauma. Uh, little t trauma is very, it's more common, number one, it's virtually 100% of, you know, uh, everyone uh, in this culture now. Uh, and it's very insidious. So it, it it's not obvious until it's been pointed out to us a lot of times that, that it even was trauma. It becomes normal. Oh, this is how I've always been. Mm -hmm. For me, it was emotionally numbing. I was very, I was very, very left-brained. And it, that's just how I was. What do you mean? something's wrong like what what are you talking about there's nothing wrong right and then once once it's pointed out oh okay so it's very subtle mm -hmm. to a lot of people and so the, and that's the challenge with it is is the, the big the overt stuff is obvious you know that but the covert trauma as i call it or developmental trauma i'll sometimes use is to, to mean the same thing is over a period of time normally years it it's cumulative and so and it just sneaks up on a lot of people and, and that's where a lot of our hearts take on roles, i.e. defense mechanisms or coping strategies to deal with, with that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so that's kind of how I see those, those two, two types, over, overt and covert. Right. I totally agree with the way you're framing that. And I just want to add in there that the little t trauma or the covert or developmental trauma can be very easily dismissed, not only by ourselves, but by society right? Um, capitalism is a trauma. <laughs> and yet here we are all having to comply with that approach. So I just wanted to put in there, if you find yourself using firefighters or managers, like you've become aware of what that might look like in your life, and yet you think that there's no trauma, you may be looking for little T type things. So a way to describe this is if you come home every day and nobody recognizes you, you say hi and no, there's no response every day. That might be okay on one or two days or every once in a while because people get busy and distracted. But every day, the bottom line message and the injury is you're not worth my time and energy. And we absorb that. And then that's what we think, usually because we're young, the whole world is like. And so these development of parts not only help us deal with our internal distress, but also navigating what we think the world is like. Do you have any thoughts about navigating the world with little t trauma or steps people can take to start to identify that in themselves? Yeah. I, I mean, you're so on point with, again, it, it, it's just how the world is and it, it is very often dismissed and we will, people will even often have parts that come online to, that say they're not, oh, I don't have trauma. And you can see that that's, there's a function behind that, that, that denial is, is useful, uh, especially when we're young to just, keep on keeping on and try to get through what's going on. Hope things will get better. Uh, usually they don't, sometimes they do, but then when we become adults, again, those parts are stuck mm -hmm. in the past. So there's, there's a lot of people don't realize. And even if it's pointed out to them, as you said, they'll, they'll deny it. No, no, that my, I had a happy childhood that we hear that all the time. And it, it doesn't take very many questions to, you know, usually figure out that that was not so much the case, but it, it's a coping strategy to think that way mm -hmm. until the person is ready uh, to deal with it. And normally what happens is things have to get bad enough. Like there, there's a quote from someone, we have to suffer into truth mm. and it's sad. And it, with that, what he's referring to, I think it, it's a, a guy who said it is that for many of us, and I put myself in this category, like things have to get to a certain level of unpleasantness before we're willing to look inside. Because if things are okay, then we're just going to keep on going with life and, and not realize that we have all these protectors doing all these things that, that you know, aren't are very stressful and are just kind of adding to the, to the load internally. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm rambling or making sense, but that, that's my thought. 
Okay. You are making sense. And I, I just want to put a caveat in there that if you consider yourself to be somebody who is successful, congratulations, first of all, because you probably are, right? From that, our, from our society perspective, I am somebody, um, and I'm just going to tell a little personal story here, Terry. If you have any insight, please, I'm always open, right? I, um, I am a very successful person on paper. Right. I've done leadership stuff. I have lots of degrees and I don't feel that all the time. All those successes that are there came out of traumatized responses from me. I had a ton of managers doing a lot of work for decades. And that bubble finally burst when I was in my 40s and already a therapist. And so my point here is if you consider yourself successful and you're fine, you might want to look at, have you ever felt exhausted? Have you ever felt burned out? Have you ever felt like even though you just achieved something, it doesn't fulfill you? That might be an indicator to dig a little bit deeper. Um, any thoughts about people who are really successful on paper, but they're not satisfied with their life? How would IFS, that happens to a lot of CPTSDers. We're super successful in the world because we've had to put on this front right, of, of being good enough or whatever the bottom line core belief is. Um, how do you deal with people that traditional approaches would call resistant? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Resistance is, is one of our least favorite yeah. terms in IFS, right? And it, it, and it really is like, who's resistant to the, the therapist or the client? You know, that's kind of how we, how we joke about it. Uh, but yeah, we. Oh, what's your What's your opinion? Uh, well, the, usually the therapist. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Because uh, because resistant is a a pathological term, so yeah. it's it's not one that I use. Uh, if if a part is resisting, quote unquote, the approach, then that we the the challenge is finding out why, not labeling it and and assuming it's the problem because the parts are protecting. So if a part is nervous, there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of safety, and that has to be developed. Something sometimes it takes a while. Yep. So that that's part of again honoring everything uh, that that comes up. But but yeah, I love what you said. It, it's not not you know trauma responses can result in good things. They can drive professional success. Uh, and but but eventually there's typically a cost. And and you nailed it perfectly with oh I have this professional success but I'm still not happy. I'm not satisfied. I need more success i have this money but i need more like that more 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 that very capitalistic attitude uh is is that's parts driving a person looking externally for happiness and for joy and we know that 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 doesn't work but it always seems like oh just this one more thing you know just this one more step in my career or i'll get this car or i'll get this house mm -hmm. it, it always seems like it'll happen but then it wears off because that that's not it's just and it's just not sustainable so i think that's the, and that's i think a big place where people realize it is it sounds like you did eventually that uh this i'm, I'm on the uh, hamster wheel here and uh, let's look at what's driving that and, and that's where an approach like ifs is so helpful so very helpful so let's talk in this last little piece about first of all why you think somebody should use IFS for CPTSD and that complex or developmental type trauma. And if they choose to do that, what would a typical progression look like? And I know everybody's an individual, so please feel free to caveat that as much as you need to. Um, but usually there's an arc, you know, where you can kind of anticipate how the treatment is being received. So what would it look like if you were starting to see improvement? What, what would your typical client arc be? Sure. Yeah. So, so why someone would use IFS, it, it, you know, we've talked about so many things, the self-compassionate nature of it, the, the avoidance of you using diagnoses, which are really just descriptors of symptoms that don't actually explain anything. Uh, the way I like to phrase it in IFS isn't the only approach in this category, but it's a bottom-up approach where we're working with the unconscious because that's what's driving all of these issues. The, these parts are largely operating outside of conscious awareness. And so anything that's top down, like cognitive or behavioral, doesn't get to the root of it for me. Not that it can't help, but really the, those approaches are managing, trying to manage managers. Right. And that can be done 
to a degree, but it's usually temporary. And sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't like it and they'll come back even stronger. So IFS, bottom up, getting to the root of, of why. And under and once we understand why, that's when, you know, if, if you don't understand why, it's very hard to know what to do to, to affect change. So, mm -hmm. so that, that to me is the beauty uh, of IFS. Uh, in terms of progression, yeah, super, super person dependent, but we're going to start with protectors typically, uh, as, as I said, and we're going to develop those relationships between the client self uh, and the protectors. And, and then when the protectors are ready to get permission, which quite frankly, sometimes is in one session, uh, sometimes it takes longer. It just mm -hmm. depends on what that protector's had to deal with uh, over the decades. Uh, then we're going to get introduced to the exiles uh, and we're going to hear their stories and find out what they've been carrying for all this time, what, what they've wanted to, th these parts just, they, they want to be heard so, so badly. And, and this is how they get that. They they connect with the person's self, uh, and and then the person's self can hear their story, hear what they went through, sharing memories in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. and and then after that, there's an unburdening process uh, where we release the trauma that the part is carrying. We we bring in good qualities that the part wants, like joy and love, uh, and then that part is then brought to the present, uh, so it's not stuck in the past anymore the age doesn't change normally but we're just getting it out of where it's been stuck or exiled uh, for so long and then that part is effectively healed and then there's a there's a check-in process daily afterwards to make sure everything okay because it's a big change mm -hmm. for these parts like it, it's really a, it's a transformation in a lot of ways uh, and then with that so there's a process for that just to stay in touch for for a few weeks with that part uh, and then for a given protector, once you've healed the parts that it's protecting, which can be more than one, uh, that protector has no reason anymore to do what it's been doing. So if it's a protector driving an addiction, again, they don't want to be doing that any more than the person likes doing it. So they're usually very, very happy to give that role up mm -hmm. and take on a different role. And they get to choose. We tell them, what would you like to do instead? And sometimes it's going to the beach because like, they just want to chill. Uh, and sometimes it's, oh, I want to be an advisor to you, to the self, for an example. So something more productive, more relaxing, more enjoyable. Uh, and so that's the general, that, that's a very high level healing uh, process. And there's different numbers of protectors and exiles for everybody that that need attention, but that's, that's the gist of how we get the healing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was clear. And thank you for the step-by-step. -step. I have a couple questions. Um, one is, when you say release trauma, that's a really common thing for people in our field to say. What does that actually mean in IFS? Yeah, good question. Uh, and it, so the IFS process for this, and, and this is the beauty of IFS having evolved organically by Richard Schwartz just listening to his clients. And, and that's how he learned about parts. And he started putting this all together, which is by working with people. So the actual releasing of trauma in IFS, interestingly, is very shamanic in nature. It's we invite the part to give give up all these self beliefs and all these emotions to light, fire, wind, air, water, or or something else that they come up with. Sometimes they'll have a different idea that we go with, but and then it's the self can self describes to them how that's done, and then we invite the part find where in your body the, these beliefs and emotions are stored, and pull it out. Pull them all out, throw them into a fire, into a into into a lake, you know, whatever the part chooses, uh, and that's that's how that happens. And it it's uh, you know describing it like this, it's hard not to kind of do it at this service because it sounds very okay. It's just a vis visualization, but it's not. This stuff is real, and the, the people a lot of times can feel it right then. Oh, I feel lighter. For example, someone just said that to me today uh, when that stuff comes out. And then we, we bring in the good qualities in the same way. Just just work with the part, have the part pull, pull all that in with a beam of light uh, or whatever the case may be. And, and then at that point, that, that part's trauma is gone. And it normally doesn't come back unless we've missed something in the process. Like we missed a step or we didn't get a protector's permission. Uh, then we might have to do it again. But normally once it's gone, it's gone and that part is free to, to be its authentic self.
And it is a beautiful and magical process that gives me chills every time I experience it with myself or a client. It's amazing. I just wanted to add, um, for those of you who might be hesitant about getting in touch with parts or about what uh, might come out of that, the IF practitioners that I know and all the materials really stress the fact that we're never going to bully apart. That's not how that works. And so there can be a lot of time if you have a particularly busy part or intensive part that has a lot of jobs or has been doing it since you were one and a half. Sometimes there is multiple sessions involved with that. And I just want to check in, which is good and fine, because we want to take it at the right rate or pace for the part. One of the things I remember um, from my IFS training is that if you, when we start with a part, we complete that part. Is that still true in IFS training? It's been uh, several years since I've gone. Yeah, generally it, it, it's true. Uh, I, I, like you said, we don't, we don't prescribe, we don't bully, we don't prescribe. So if, uh, so the witnessing piece where we're witnessing what the part wants to share and what it's been through. Sometimes you do that and then you're you're at the end of the session or you're close. And so you don't have time to do the rest, the unloading. So so there are breaks there. There are points where you can stop and say, okay, we'll continue uh, next time. Now, normally next time, yeah, we'll start with that one. But it's possible in that week that's, that something else major has come up for the client and those parts are too activated to try to go back to the one. So sometimes that happens. We Either way is fine, but we, we do, as soon as we can, we get back to that one to certainly finish what we started Mm -hmm. and that activation in my experience happens in two different places in the treatment arc one is right at the beginning where everything is triggering all the time right you're it's so much new information and expansion that it's just hard to manage right and the other is when we get through kind of this medium area and start getting into deep exile territory where the deep wounds are really coming up has that been your experience as well that um I mean, parts got to keep protecting, right? <laughs> they do. <laughs> oh, look what they're yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's well said. And, and because sometimes it's so interesting how what happen, the things that can happen. So sometimes when we first start working with exiles, the other ones will see, ooh, they're getting attention. Now I want some. Hmm. So then they can start coming up. So you, you may see an increase in symptoms, right? Because now they, and it's it's just that they're calling for help is what it is because they see what, Ooh, that that's beautiful. Now I want some of that. So there can be some of that at the beginning, uh, as you said, and, and yeah, but yeah, we just being open and, and like you said, not forcing anything, not, not going in with an agenda, which is so hard for us in this work. Like we have to really, so much of IFS is working on our parts as practitioners yeah. so that we were not, and that's easier said than done, but that's our job, right? So we figure that out, but just being open to what comes and, and just rolling with it. It's a flexible and beautiful therapy. And I really appreciate your time being here and unpacking a lot of those concepts. Um, In closing, is there a tip or two that you would like to give our audience either about connecting with an IFS practitioner, like how to find one, what to look for, uh, because you're not all trained at the same level and sometimes that can matter, um, or just day in, day out advice on how to be okay with your parts? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. Uh, in terms of looking for a practitioner, I don't have too much uh, on that. I think you get a feel for it a lot of times in the consult or how, you know, however the practitioner approaches that. Uh, and and it, it's so much of it is like that rapport is so critical, as you know, but between, and it, it's sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So the client just has to go with her gut uh, to the extent possible. Oh, this feels right. Uh, and then it usually works out from there. I think when we get into trouble is when we override our instincts and our gut feelings with the, the left side of the brain that, that usually does not go well. Uh, so I think watching out for that is, is, is important there. Uh, yeah, day to day, I think it, w- what happened for me and what, what happens for people is that when, once we become parts aware, so to speak, like you can't forget it. You know, it's like riding a bike. So, so, so much of the, another beautiful thing about IFS is that we do the work, clients are encouraged to do work in between sessions because it's great to have an hour a week or whatever it is. But, but if, if that's the only hour when you're thinking about this stuff, it, it you're going to be limited in, in terms of the healing 
progression. So there's parts work that can be done explicitly in between sessions where the person is taking themselves inside, but also implicitly just day to day. If, if when a reaction comes, just noticing, oh, that a, a part of me is angry. A part of me is really scared right now, and I don't know why. And just that separation, that little bit of unblending day to day makes a world of difference in terms of how strong that like it, it, you, the reaction doesn't take over when we separated from it. So you can catch it and this comes with practice, but the quicker you catch it and it's not to get rid of it. It's just to say, Oh, that's a part of me. That's not me. It's not, I am scared. A part of me is scared. Isn't that interesting? And that really kind of turns on the curiosity and also the compassion as we talked about. So that that's a lot of the work that I encourage people to do. And it's really good work that you can capitalize on because most of us are already using parts language to some degree, just as American United States citizens. I don't know about the rest of the world, but here we'll say things like part of me wants this and part of me wants that. And so when you can just take that kind of concept that you can be divided and then notice in those perfect moments that it's just a part, it's not yeah. all or nothing. And I also would just caveat on there. There's no moral, it, there's no morality to parts. There's not good parts or bad parts, as we've already said. And so I love that you're opening up the idea just day in and day out to start observing and getting curious about what a part might be doing. Well said. Yeah, it's so powerful. All right. Well, my tip for everybody is the next time you're scrolling through social media and you see one of those videos where you're like, oh my gosh, that full grown person is acting like a toddler. Remember you're seeing a part. Just remember that and try and integrate the idea into your mind a little bit more. It's everywhere. Carrie, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye? I don't think I do. No, this has been beautiful. It's been such a great experience. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and setting this up. It's been my pleasure. And you have been so informative to our audience. I really appreciate it. If you ever want to come back and share more information, let me know. I am totally down with that. Everybody, the best thing that you can do for yourself today is take a breath and see yourself with a little bit more compassion. If you want to learn more about soul retrievals, which we've been talking about through this series, you can go to my private community, Karmic Alchemy, and we're talking about it next week. So um, that will be the beginning of October for those of you who are, this may be not released by that time. Carrie, thanks for standing here while I'm rambling. I appreciate your time. Um, I would encourage the audience to check out some of your writing. And one of the best ways to get there is through your website. Can you remind us one more time what that is? Yes, healingtheself.net. Thank you so much, Terry, and hopefully we'll run into each other again. I hope so. Thank you, Tabitha. Okay, bye-bye.